How's it going everybody? This is Beat the Bush. Today I'm going to talk about how being too cheap is really like a mental disorder. This video is brought to you by Webull. If you guys are interested in supporting this channel, you can sign up for this free trading app and you can get two free shares of stock just for depositing $100. Once you get these two free shares of stock, it is yours to keep. The $100 that you put in is still your money. You can withdraw it if you want. You can buy stock with it if you want. Check out my referral link down in the video description below. Now, I'm not talking about being too cheap if you don't have money to begin with. I'm talking about those people that earns a lot of money and yet are still really, really cheap. I've been there. I know exactly how the thought process goes. Let's say you started saving money, 30, 40% of your income. You feel good about it. And then you save a little bit more. You feel a little bit better about it and you just keep on going and going until you save what? 80% of your income, 90% of your income. It becomes a thing where everything you do, you try to spend as little money as possible. If you find the lowest, lowest cost, maybe if it's free or maybe you get paid to do it, even better. If you only spend like 10 cents on it, oh, that's like, you know, you got out of this little deal thing unscathed. It didn't hurt your wallet at all and you didn't spend any money. So, you know, it considered this a win. This is how it goes with everything in life was sort of kind of like that for me before. For example, you might do things where when you buy something to eat, you buy the cheapest food the cheapest of the cheapest. Maybe it's not organic, but I never did that. I still bought organic food. You never go out to eat. Check, I did that. You minimize utilities where it changes your way of life, where you feel uncomfortable because you're not using your utilities anymore, such as water, electricity, heat. Now, let me tell you guys about the story of this lady where I went to Perpignan in France. I was just visiting over there and I got an Airbnb. I can tell that she was really, really cheap just walking in the door because it was freezing cold in this home. And actually when I went to take a shower, the water wasn't even hot at all. So I realized that she probably, you know, turned down the heat on the hot water heater so low that, you know, I was freezing taking the shower. I just basically couldn't, you know, finish taking a shower. So I do believe that it's hindering her ability to live a comfortable life, but you know, I don't know what's underneath. I don't know her finances or whatnot. Maybe she's really hurting for money. That's why she's renting those Airbnb out. But it appears to me that she lives in a very nice home and maybe she might be kind of well off. And there's a lot of people like this, a lot of people that <laughs> kind of like me over here, lives in a pretty nice home. And then they're scrimping so hard that, you know, their standard of living is kind of, you know, bordering poverty. Soon you fall into this lowest common denominator of being the witch of Wall Street. Hetty Green, nicknamed Witch of Wall Street, was an American businesswoman and financier known as the richest woman in America during that time. During the Gilded Age, she was known for her wealth and was named by the Guinness Book of World Records as the greatest miser. Yeah, I, I, you know, miser has a negative connotation, but you know, miser is just a person that never wants to spend any money at all. And when you're trying to save 100% of your income, 90% of your income, whatever percentage, right? Someone that tries to be financially independent and retire early, squarely, goes towards that way now that I realize. <laughs> I guess I see the light now and that's why I'm making this video. I want to tell you guys about the downfalls of, you know, this really steep slope over here. Let me continue. Her frugality extended to family life. When her son Ned broke his leg as a child, Hetty tried to have him admitted to a free clinic for the poor. She has 100 million of today's equivalent dollars and she submitted her son, her son, for the clinic of the poor, all right. Mythic accounts have her storming away after being recognized. I'm like, what are you doing here? You're not poor. But then, you know, if you look at her picture, she's like all raggedy, looks like a witch and stuff. Her biographer, Slack, says that she paid her bill and took her son to other doctors. Okay, this sounds reasonable, right? Take her to other doctors, get the leg healed. But then his leg did not heal properly. And after years of treatment, it had to be amputated. This is just sad, like, because it can get to that point where you're so frugal, where you just try to not to spend any money, even 
like including medical expenses, right? You could totally get into this phase where you like balk at everything. You go, oh my gosh, you know, today's healthcare is just ridiculously expensive. And if they go, oh yeah, you know, it's like $20,000 for this surgery for your son, I can, I can see, you know, some people might get there. I'm not sure if I'm gonna get there. You guys sitting at home, just kind of reflect upon yourself. Am I doing something like this? Am I heading that way? Because, you know, even if you are, you know, halfway there, it's still really, really bad, you know, to be too frugal, to be scrimping on everything, and not just your own son, right? You could be skimping on yourself and just kind of really, really lowering your own standard of living. Now I want to talk about uh, a six-figure salary. Let's say you earn 10K every single month. This is after tax, okay? So before tax, maybe you're in the six figure somewhere, okay? This is just to make the figures kind of round. And going by the, you know, if you follow my channel and you do everything exactly the way I do, you might, you know, end up spending only $2,000. This is pretty extreme, right? But I can totally see some engineers going around doing this. Maybe they're living in a van in front of Google or something and they only have to spend $2,000 a month. They're saving eight, thousand of it so then you save 80 percent of your income this means that every single year that you work you save four years worth of your retirement but you have to live the same exact way as before retirement because you know you're going to be spending a roughly the same amount two thousand dollars every single month now in the fire community there's this chart that goes the more you save the faster that you can get towards retirement. For example, if you spend only $1,000 a month, this is really extreme, and you're at this 90% savings rate, that means every single year that you work, you save nine years worth of retirement. You don't have to do this for many years before you can actually really, really retire. Four or five years of work, right? You can save 45 years of retirement if you live the same exact way. This is the new way I'm looking at it. Each miserable year that you are living, you're essentially saving for nine more miserable years that you're gonna live in your retirement. This is how it's gonna work. Yes, you can probably talk yourself into saying, oh yeah, this is not that bad. You kind of fall prey into this romantic idea that you can retire early, you don't have to work anymore. You kind of lay on the beach, don't do anything. You don't have to have a boss anymore. And this vicious cycle can actually get you to accept more pain than you normally would. I'm not saying to be a crazy spender. I'm not saying YOLO your life away, spend your entire paycheck on everything. I'm just saying that you could let up a little bit, spend a little bit more. If I were spending only $1,200, I could essentially double this amount. You know, I spent $3,000, you know? All of a sudden I have $1,800 of extra spending money and yet I'm still saving 70% of my income, this is pretty reasonable. And you are way on your way to fire, retire early and everything, and yet you can still live a respectable life. Now you guys might be wondering, where did I get this $1,200 from? I've reviewed this many, many times, so I'm just gonna go over it really, really quickly. $400 on my housing because I have my house paid off, $400 on health insurance roughly, $200 on food, $100 roughly on car insurance, and another $100 on utilities. I'm not actually all talk over here. The things I'm talking about today, these are actually things I realized myself. This is actually happening to my life in real time. Like, I just thought about this. This is what's in my head. This basically, these this last week or so, it's been occupying my mind space and this is what I meditate about and I think about this day in and day out. I'm like thinking about my life. How am I gonna improve it? What am I doing wrong? You know, this is like a major revelation for me. That's why I'm sharing this in this video for you guys. Let me actually go bring some of those things that I bought uh, on camera. Just hold on. Okay, here's the stuff. Lots of stuff, very consumerism. I am still very aware of the things I'm buying. I'm not going around buying a Rolex because I don't really like a watch, right? I'm not buying like brand name stuff just to show off the brand name. So there's, there's some limits to how crazy I'm going with spending money. I do a lot of reflecting on thinking the reasons why I buy certain things and 
Sometimes there are things I would have never bought that I suddenly decided I should now because you know, it's, it's like a change of paradigm for me and I can't say how, you know, I'm pretty happy with these things. This is like a front trunk mat, okay? In the Tesla Model 3, it doesn't come with this thing. And every single time I open it, I look at it, I look at the bare bottom and I'm like, oh, it looks so ugly. And for a long time, I just kind of, you know, ignored it. I try to ignore it and I'm like, ugh. You know, but once I got this, I put this in, I'm like, oh, everything feels so great. It feels complete. So it's kind of like me getting the case for that GoPro, right? It's like you're just completing the package. It's just the way it is. And I bought the rear trunk thing, you know, the, the rear trunk mat because I stick my uh, electric scooter in there. And every single time I put it in, the wheels are kind of dirty and stuff. And it gets the carpet in there kind of dirty. And, you know, anyway, you got this thing. So then if anything spills, it's not going to get things dirty and I can just pull it out if there's a bunch of dirt on it. A lot of people, they would not hesitate to buy something like this. Well, these people don't have the same mental illness as I do. I feel like I, I probably did have some sort of mental illness with spending money. I sort of somehow got myself into this hole for like financial independence or whatnot and just saving, saving, saving and you know, kind of getting to that point of kind of like which of Wall Street or whatnot. Anyway, let me put that away. I've shared with you guys a 3D printer on this channel before. You might have missed it, but within that 3D printer, I actually cannot print anything more than, you know, like about this wide because the surface was just kind of uneven. And, you know, most of the time I'm just like, oh, I'm just going to deal with it. I'm just gonna print whatever and it turns out that the build quality is really bad because uh, the first layer needs to be within tolerance. It needs to be so flat that when the 3D printer goes and print, it's not too far off across the entire surface. So if you get a glass plate, which is what I finally did, which is also something I did not buy before, it was only like $18. And this is something I didn't buy because I was too cheap to buy it. Um, I don't know why, but then now that I bought it, I'm like, oh my gosh, it just kind of opened so many doors with the things that I could print. The first thing I can print is this little tray. This tray itself, I think if you go on Amazon and buy it, it's like a little console tray that fits in the car, okay? This is like $15 or something. So me getting an $18 plate printed out something that's $15 and the material is probably like two or $3. And I also printed this thing. This fits a Nalgene water bottle and it goes into the cup holder. And then the Nalgene, it's roughly this size and it just fits perfectly in here. So this is also something, I guess I could have printed this before, but this I definitely cannot because the print area was you know, a bit smaller. I share this with you guys because sometimes when you upgrade something, you extend the capabilities of something and you make it so that that item is usable. I've seen this multiple times with a lot of people where they just fail to um, upkeep the products that they own. Maybe they're too cheap to buy the glass plate. Maybe they're too cheap to buy some replacement part or something and they just kind of deal with it and then they use this item with the reduction in functionality and they just kind of bear with it. I have other examples and I've seen this with other people. That's why I want to share this with you guys. It's so important that this message gets through because it has kind of changed my life so much. Changed my life with this. All of a sudden, I don't have to, you know, reach in there and grab all this stuff. This is so useful. In my spending spree, you know, I bought a controller. I can play the little video game that's in the car. Now I got two more examples of these upkeep things and I wanna share it because you know, you might relate to you guys. I have a drill. The drill's battery just kinda died out, right? And I know for certain, for some people, they would actually not replace the battery until it's really, really dead. This is what I kinda did. I'm kinda embarrassed to admit this, but I have a DeWalt drill, a hand drill, a wireless drill, and then the battery is like, NICAD or something. It's really old and basically it would work. You can use it for maybe a minute and then the battery would die and then you can recharge it and everything. Except now 
this drill would only operate for a minute. The thing is, I personally don't use this drill all that often. I might only use it for a minute, actually. It's like really rare that I use it. So then I always keep on putting it off and go, I don't really need it, right? I don't even use that drill all that much. But the thing people do not realize is that this drill that just sits there has a reduced functionality and you're not gonna be able to use it when you do need to use it. And I would have to admit, it has died on me before. I was just doing something, you know, a couple of weeks ago and it died on me. I always just kind of like keep on pressing it and I, I'm like, oh yeah, squeeze more juice out of it, hoping it'll, you know, keep on drilling a hole in the wall. So the battery was like $30 or something. And it just, you gotta upkeep the things that you use. Another example is these jigsaw blades, a jigsaw. It's like this little thing that goes up and down, right? And there's a blade and then you can cut various pieces of wood with it. I just use it to cut whatever around the house I need it to. These panels back there has these brackets that extends out and it looks kind of ugly. So I had to cut them shorter and then reattach them, right? So when I went to the jigsaw to cut this, I don't know what happened to me after all this purging of stuff, trying to minimize things, right? I somehow for many, many years, I would cut with the same blade, it was dull, and the blade would move, right? And it would not cut very well. And for some reason, I didn't even realize that it's not cutting, you know? You're just kind of pushing it through, and it's like, it kind of cuts, because if you work hard enough, even a dull blade is gonna cut through that metal. So for some reason, with all this minimizing, with all this expending stuff, I just go, you know what, this is just dull. I don't know why I didn't realize this before. So then I checked all the blades and then I kind of touched them at the area where it cuts and I realized, wow, you know, most of the blades I was using were actually dull and I still have like some new ones sitting around. So I'm like toss, 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 toss. So I tossed like half of those blades and I kept only the ones that do actually cut. Why is this important? Is because I think there's a lot of people out there. Maybe they were too cheap, just like I was where maybe you keep the things for way too long beyond its useful life when it's not useful anymore when it's just marginally useful you still keep it this is what i was doing and that's why i think this is kind of like a disease this is a mental disorder when something breaks when a blade is dull when it kind of cuts but not really it's time to throw that blade away it's not time to save it and i don't know try to cut something and then you kind of swap it with another one, but then you realize that blade is also kind of dull and then you just keep on switching it. I've done this like once or twice before when I was cutting stuff and then you just keep on swapping them and it wastes time. You know, you're, it's not doing the job. And then when you cut stuff, it's not as nice and you spend more time cutting because it's dull. There's a lot of downsides to that anyway. Um, I'm getting kind of like in a heated discussion over here. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It comes from like so deep within me that, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to share these things with you guys. Don't forget to give me a like, comment down below. Let me know if this hits home for you. And especially if, if you're going to go around replacing some little things, that's not much money. And as always, don't forget to push that subscribe button and ring that bell icon. Thanks for watching.